going to demonstrate this today in a powerful way about serving others. Do you know that customers come to your, your job to be served? And if you can serve them, you'll have the customer come back. Do you know that in marriage, if we serve each other, husbands with wives, wives with husbands, we'll have a happy life? Happy wife, happy life. And that comes through serving each other. Hey, kids, hey, young people, welcome to church. Guess what? If you clean your room and serve your parents, guess what? Life's going to go good for you. Parents love blessing kids that do good, right? Amen. And how about this? If we all served God and served each other in this church, wouldn't this be a better place as we grow to 200, 300, 400? If we all served each other, instead of having our chairs marked out, uh, excuse me, this is my chair. You're sitting in my chair Sunday morning. I'm sorry, it's marked for me. You know, uh, you know wouldn't we love church instead of gossiping about each other and then talking about each other? We want a kind of church that serves each other, don't we? It's all about serving others. As a matter of fact, Jesus God in the flesh served you. Did you know that? Did you know that by Jesus coming in the flesh, laying down his life, he served you? He served it unto God, and we're going to talk about that, that all we do for others is really for God, but others are involved. When we serve God, we can't do it without serving others. Write that down. That's good. We can't serve God without serving God others. You can't do it. The moment you say, I love God, he's going to say, you got to love some people. And the moment you start loving people, you're going to realize how unloving they are. Most people don't want to love you back in return. Most customers don't say thank you after you worked hard for them. Most people, it doesn't come easy. It doesn't. So we have got to be on another level. We have got to be like Christ who serves the people that don't even deserve it. How about this? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Take care of people who don't take care of you. You know, we're supposed to help others even if they don't help us. We're supposed to do unto them as we would want done unto us. We're not to do unto others as they've done unto us. Haven't we come through a call, come into a time in our culture where it's like an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth again? You know, like you're trying to get in, uh, you know, into traffic, you know, merge into the lane. They don't let you merge over. So finally, when you get up into that lane, you're like slamming on the brakes. You're like, take that. Take that. You know, you're like, you're like trying to like get them to, you know, bump into your car so you can get a free check or something. Hello. I don't know if anybody's done that. You know, but, but in traffic, it's like an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Oh, you don't let me in? Well, I'm going to go slow now. It's the same thing on the job. You know, somebody comes in with an attitude. Well, you got an attitude. Oh, snap. It's going down right now. I got an attitude. You want me to go there? I'm going to go there. You know, girls taking off their earrings, slicking back their hair. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? We, we all have a line. Think, think about this. We all have a line that once it's crossed, we say, you don't deserve the golden rule no more. You cross that line, no more golden rule for you. This is now the ghetto rule right now. This is called slap you in the face rule. I'm going to give you this much grace. You cross it, it's on. But what I love about Jesus, and we're going to read the whole passage today about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. When we look at Jesus, he washed Judas' feet. He washed Peter's feet, and Peter betrayed him how many times? Three times. He washed his disciples' feet, and we need to serve people like this. It doesn't matter who they are or what they do to us. We need to serve them. I didn't say be their doormat. I said serve them. Sometimes the best thing you can say is no. When a homeless person asks me for money, I say no, but I'll buy you something to eat because I don't want to uh, keep them in a drug addiction. We'll bring them to Teen Challenge. So I'm not saying be a doormat. I'm not saying being people's personal slaves. I'm saying serve people. And the definition of serving people is doing good unto them when it's in your power to do so. When it's in your power to serve, 
do it. Help people. So let's say you today can't help 100 people, but you can help one. Maybe somebody needs a ride home from church. See, that's serving. Of course, we couldn't expect you to take everybody home, but what you can do, do. John Wesley, the preacher from uh, the 1700s, the Methodist revival came from this heart of serving. He said, do all the goods you can to as many people as you can, as long as you can and whenever you can. Do the best you can do. Are you guys ready to read it? Say amen. Look at John chapter 13. We're going to read the whole passage. It was just before the Passover festival, starting in verse 1. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. It was already put it into his heart. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus ain't sweating it. And that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord... Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Then Lord Simon Peter said, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Give me a bath, Jesus. Verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have a, had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that, that is why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he said? Do you understand? That's the question I want us to ask ourselves. Do we understand what Jesus did for us? Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, verily, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Somebody say, do it. That's what we're going to do today. We're washing your feet. We're going to wash every person's feet in this church today to serve you so that you may Go out and be a servant. We want you to see today the example of this church serving its leadership and its leadership serving you. Some of you might say to yourself, Pastor, this might be a woman speaking, God forbid if it's a guy, but women might be saying, I don't want nobody to see my feet. I didn't get a petty. I would challenge you today not to let that be your excuse. Because God commanded us to do it. God commanded us to do it. We are here to wash one another's feet. In the culture of Jesus' time 2,000 years ago, the foot washing was done by the lowest servant or the youngest servant at the totem pole. These servants would come and expect to wash the feet of these men and women who walked with sandals in an agricultural culture that had dung and dirt mixed together. These servants came expecting. It wasn't a surprise. They came expecting to find stinky feet, feet with dirt and dung residue all over it. But nonetheless, they did it. And that was their assignment. And so when Jesus rises from the table at Passover, this is like the biggest celebration the Jewish people would have when Jesus, the guest of honor, the Son of God in the flesh, took off his robe. He wasn't shirtless. They wore uh, like a T-shirt underneath the robe, so it wasn't like Jesus like became Fabio, you know, if you were wondering. I don't know if anybody else was wondering. Sorry that I was wondering because it doesn't look like you guys caught that. It says he took off his robe, okay? He had a shirt underneath, but he takes off his suit as it were, and now he has on his t-shirt and shorts. He has on his casual clothes, and he got down on his knees and began to wash 
his disciples' feet. And what we begin to realize at this point is that Peter, like most of us, has a reaction that says, this is backwards. Jesus, you can't wash my feet. This is the job of the lowest servant. This is the lowest totem pole. This is the worst job in the house. Jesus, you can't do this. We're supposed to wash your feet. We're supposed to take care of you. You're our Lord and Savior. You see, I've been to India, and in India they have a culture of gurus there where men claim to be God. But unlike Jesus, these men who claim to be God, these Maharishis or these different yogis that walk around, they get treated totally different. They get treated like God. They get roses put around their hands all the time. They get their whole body, not just their feet cleansed. They get washed by their disciples. Could you imagine if you had to wash me today? I'm being serious. They, they literally are fanned while the, the preaching is going on. I've seen it in person. These yogis are treated like God upon the earth and given all of these special privileges. But you know, not our God. See, our God came to love his creation. He actually said in another place, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I didn't come for you to treat me like who I already know I am. I've come to save you because you don't know who you are. See, when Jesus was on the earth, he knew it was about man's heart and man that needed to be saved. He already had glory in heaven, and, and he didn't need our glory to give to him our worship. Sometimes people think Jesus is self-centered because he wants us to worship him. Listen to me, baby. He could make dancing angels and send us all to hell and still be God. He don't need you. He's God all by himself. He gives you the privilege of worshiping him because worship to him will change and transform your life. Once you understand the principle of praises going up and blessings coming down, you'll be the first one to hit your knees, clap your hands, and say hallelujah because worship is on a transformational level for you as you give it back to him. Are you all tracking with me? Just think about all the parents here with your kids. I don't need my kids to say thank you. I still got a job. I don't need them to be nice to me because I still got a house. But when they say thank you, when they say nice things and they're obedient, I bless them. I favor them. God don't need us. We need God. Get it right. But I love our Jesus in the Bible. He could have been like that. And rightly so. He was God. Not like these men who die, get buried, and they go to their grave like Buddha and keep decorating their grave. By the way, Buddha came from Hindu religion. He was a guru to the Hindu faith. Many don't know that. He was an offshoot of Hinduism. So you think of how Buddha was treated and how these statues and idols, but Jesus is exactly the opposite. Jesus comes to serve. Jesus comes to die on a cross. Could you put up that picture so we can get the image from this movie, this depiction of it? This is how Jesus came, to die, to suffer, so that we might be saved. You see, we needed not only our feet cleaned, but our whole lives cleaned. And when Peter said no, what he was actually doing was acting out of pride. You know, it's easy for you to get caught up in this kind of Peace Corps attitude when you become a part of the church, and I'm just helping people, I'm helping people. But the moment someone wants to help you and serve you in a humble way, you'll begin to see another sense of pride you didn't think you had. For example, I'll be the first one to compliment people in the church. Thank you, brother, for the, for the illustration. I'll be the first one to come up to somebody and say, hey, you're doing awesome. You're doing well. But the moment somebody says it to me, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just the... But you know what that is? That's a form of pride. You see, there's a self-abasing pride that says, no, no, I'm not good enough. No, I'm not good. No, not me. And then there's a self-exalting pride. Oh, everybody talk about me. Everybody talk about me. And, and sometimes we only focus on the pride that, that, that's uplifted in ourselves, and we always focus on that. But we don't focus on the pride of insecurity. We don't focus on the pride of putting ourselves down. Do you know that when you put yourself down, that's prideful? Because you're not saying who God said you were. He said you're beautiful. He said you're blessed. You say you're ugly and a loser. That's pride. See, the definition of humble is believing whatever God said. If he called you to be a leader, it's not prideful to say I'm a disciple that makes disciples. That's telling the truth. Is it prideful to call myself a man? Is it prideful? Y'all looking at me crazy. Do you, do you know who I am? Okay, hello. So is it prideful to say I'm a man? 
No. Is it prideful to say I'm a father? No, those are titles about who I am. It's the truth. For me to say otherwise would be a lie. Is it prideful for me to say I've been forgiven of all my sins? Is it prideful to say that Jesus Christ loves me? Is it prideful for me to say I'm blessed, too blessed to be stressed? may not always be easy or true, but I am. I may not always act like it, but it's true. So here's the question. Do we believe who he says we are? Because Peter, he says, no, you can't wash my feet. And then Jesus said to him, and this is a word to everybody here today, and I say it challenging to you, that if you don't want your feet washed, as we're commanded to do in his name, Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So unless, ladies, you let us wash your feet without any condo bondo to your petty, men without that funk getting in the way, you just putting them in the water, we'll pray for God to heal it. Without that becoming an excuse, if you, if you, let's put it this way, if you let that become an excuse, you have no part of Christ. Because you are to be able to let your leaders wash your feet today. You don't owe us anything. You shouldn't feel uncomfortable with that. If you do, then maybe you're dealing with a self-abasing pride. Just like Peter was dealing with saying, no, I couldn't let Jesus wash my feet. I couldn't let my pastor wash my feet. I can't let my leaders wash my feet. No, then you're dealing with a self-abasing pride. We want to wash your feet. We want to be your servants. We want the privilege of serving you. We want the church to be the first place that the culture and community we live in learns servanthood. I want the young people to not look to little Wayne and his pride or to the entertainment industry as pride. I want them to look to their pastors as humility and an example of what real men do. Could you imagine that? Little Wayne washing the feet of the band or the producers, behind the scene workers that make his music great. It would be unimaginable. But yet he's a fool not to do so because when we ever see the quarterback get exalted, when we see the musician get exalted, when we see the CEO like Apple get exalted, do you know that standing behind them is hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of servants, people working together? Even in the sinner's world, even in the world of sin, people have to serve one another to get a job done. And yet in the church, I would dare to say that this in the church for the Christian is one of the hardest deal-breaking things I've ever seen. We deal with this so bad that the moment we bring it up, people already have bad memories of when they got abused, when someone asked them to serve, but they weren't being treated correctly. See, we as pastors, I have to start by saying, forgive me if I have never, if I have uh, not always shown you the example of a servant. Look at me, please. Forgive me. If I've ever appeared to you that I'm better than you, if I have ever appeared that I am over you in the quality of my person, I may have a position of leadership here, but if I've ever appeared to be a better person than you, forgive me. And for any church, any leadership, anything that you've ever been a part of where you've been abused by leadership and it wasn't Christ-like, on behalf of them, I say to you today, I'm sorry. Pastors make mistakes. Forgive leadership. We call these wounded warriors, people in churches who have been wounded by leadership, wounded by church, and they don't see it anymore as a blessing to be a servant. But no matter what, we're all called to be servants. And you want to know how Jesus could get down and wash people's stinky feet? Look at the key verse right here. Look at what it says in verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, number one. And number two, that he had come from God and was returning to God, two and three. Look at that. Number one, he knew that all power had been given to him by God. Number two, he, he knew where he came from. Number three, where he was going. Number one, Jesus knew all power was his. Number two, he knew where he had come from. And number three, he knew where he was going. You know who make the best servants? And we're just talking across the board. We're starting today in church, but I pray this goes into your everyday life. You know who makes the best servants? Those who know what power and authority they've already been given. Your title, your job, your position never dictates your identity. 
Some of you with this economy, you've had to take different types of jobs. Maybe you were used to being a boss, an owner, a manager, a high-ranking official in your job. But now you're something less than that. Listen to me. You're still the same person. Just because a title has changed, just because a bracket of income has changed, just because you've had to downside, your identity hasn't changed. Write this down. My situation will never dictate my identity. Write that down and believe it. Jesus understood. Even if I get down on my knees and wash their feet, I'm still the son of God. I still have all the power. Just because I serve you doesn't mean I change who I am. Sometimes we want to exert our power to show we have it. Now, I asked you the example before. If I say I'm a man, is that, is that a prideful statement? No. If I say I'm a father, is that a prideful statement? No. But if I walk into my house, pull up my belt, and go, I'm a man, baby. You better listen to me, all y'all in here. I'm the daddy of this house. Who's your daddy, kids? And by the way, I talk like that when I'm at home. My wife will tell you. It's like, you are a southern black man trapped in a white Italian body. How did that happen? And I'm like, I lived in this house too long. They just messed me up. Okay, anyways. If I come home and I go, who's your daddy? I'm the man. See, that's pride because what am I doing? I am now exerting my power to fill the low self-esteem I have of my identity. When you have low self-esteem and you find yourself trying to force your identity on people, that's not their fault. That's your fault. I go around the city. Not everybody recognizes me as a pastor. Not, anybody, not everybody wants to call me a pastor. I remember meeting one Catholic person out here, and they cussed me out and said, you're no pastor. Look at you wearing T-shirt on the street talking about Jesus. My priest would never do that. And I pointed to the church like, that's a disgusting-looking church. So I get talked to sometimes. And they go, I go to a cathedral, and they had this big, uh, you know, like golden uh, cross on their neck and they just basically told me I was nothing compared to their priest I said but I'm like Jesus if your priest is not on the street doing what Jesus did he's nothing like Jesus and your cross and your religion means nothing you see what he said about me did not change my identity I'm a man of God and that's the first thing we have to learn when we serve each other when I wash your feet today I'm not saying everything you do is right I'm not saying you get to be in control of this church. I'm not saying that I'm going to get on your agenda and do whatever you want to do in life. No, when I'm washing your feet, what I'm saying to you is, how may I serve you? How may I help your God-giving purpose? How can I do what God wants in your life? How can I do a good thing for you and my ability? That's what I'm saying. And of course, for Jesus, what he was saying is, I'll save your soul. You let me wash your feet. And then, of course, you got to love people. He goes, well, just give me a bath, Jesus. If we're getting washed, come on, somebody. Let's get out. Let's have a spa for Jesus. Let's get out the cucumbers. You know, let's just be laying down, massage. we got some, massage, you know, uh, physical therapists here and different things. See, but what did he do? He missed the point. He thought that he needed a physical washing, like a baptism. Because the Jews would wash themselves all the time to pray. Muslims still do this to this day. They have to wash their ears, wash their nose, wash private parts of their body, and then they pray. It's called ritualistic washing. And, and he was beginning to think, okay, well, if you're going to wash my feet, well, then you know, wash the rest of me, wash my head. They would do this as a part of their tradition of prayer. And then he gives the, Jesus gives the revelation. And look at it right here as he reads it. He says right here, those, verse 10, those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. What does this say? If you've already been saved, you don't have to get saved again. But you need to be a servant. And you need to let people serve you. And you need to serve others. We're not saying this is the basis of your salvation. I'm not saying that you can't go to heaven without having your feet washed. Or you can't go to heaven without, you know, being a servant. But you'll be disobedient to Christ if you do. And then the Bible says at one point, if you keep being disobedient, your heart will become hard. And that disobedient heart will turn you from Christ. That's why he said if you don't allow it to happen, he'll then say you're none of his. But it would be a gradual process. It would be something. See, back, it's just like I said last week. Affairs don't happen at the day of the affair. Like, hey, babe, you want to meet me at Motel 8? How did he have her number? Right? Did you ever think about that? See, affairs don't start the day we go to Motel 8. It started the day they got, the guy got the number. It started the day. 
uh, they got a text and they started talking back and forth. It started before they uh, even got together when they were looking at pornography and having fantasy. So then when someone came into their life to fulfill the fantasy, it could build up to that day at the hotels. Everybody tracking with me? And backsliding, becoming dirty after you've been washed with a bath is the same thing. Now, you know you can go a day without a shower, right? You could probably go two days. How many know you start going a week without a shower? Somebody got to pray for you, right? It's like, man, oh, Jesus, help him, Lord. Lord, help him get a bath, Jesus. So some of you might say, Pastor, you know what? I'm not really ready to serve God. I don't want to do that right now. And you might walk out of here and seem to be okay. You may walk out of here and seem to be looking all right. But as time goes on, if you don't learn the principle of being obedient to God, the world and its filth and its dirtiness will cause your heart to backslide from Christ. That's why we are to always be obedient to Christ. Peter needed to be obedient. Nothing more, nothing less. Just do what Jesus says. Don't add to it. Don't take away. Somebody say, do it. Amen. The second thing is that we learn about why Jesus could do this is he knew where he had come from. If you look at verse 3, it said all things are under his power and that he knew he came from God. The reason why I can wash your feet today as a servant and to love you and to tell you it's my honor to help you in life in any way I can is because I know where I've come from. You see, Jesus had his identity in the Father. He knew he was the Son of God. He didn't have to worry about anybody making fun of that or taking that away from him. The Bible said when they tried to put shame on him at the cross and embarrass him, could you imagine being stripped naked, beaten, hung up? That'd be a little embarrassing. The Bible says in Hebrews, he despised the shame. He said, I ain't going to let you shame me. I'm not going to get embarrassed out of this. I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. Now, how much more us who have been forgiven of sin, who know the past that we've been saved from, how much more knowing our past should we be motivated to serve and help one another? If you really knew who you were before, if you knew the sins you used to do, if you can be honest with yourself, you'll have no problem washing somebody's feet or having your feet washed. Why? Because you know who you were. Think of it like this today. When I wash your feet, I consider it an honor because I was arrested three times. I was a high school dropout at the age of 16. I was selling drugs. I had friends that died because of their lifestyle. Some committed suicide and some are still in jail today. When Christ tells me to wash your feet, I know where I came from. I'm just happy to be alive serving Jesus. I remember one day when I was uh, praying about going to Pakistan. We were taking a mission trip to Pakistan. And Pakistan at this point was, was suffering persecution to Christians, uh, was persecuting Christians. And, and I had my two children, and we were wanting to have Lucas, our third. And I began to pray to the Lord, and I said, God, do you want me to go? And he said, I want you to go. And I said, God, but I'm afraid I'll die over there because I've seen beheading videos where the jihadists catch the missionaries or catch the people. And, and, and uh, I, I probably should never have watched it, but it scarred me because uh, I just watched them behead this one Chinese missionary and he was screaming out for help. It was, it was terrible. And this fear gripped me. And I said, God, what if they, what if they behead me? Because you see what's going on in Egypt right now, don't you? They're burning churches. Hello, this is the real deal. I said, God, I got a house. I've got two kids. What if I die? And the Lord told me what I'm going to tell you right now. He said, you almost died when the gun was pulled to your head. And I had it happen when I was 18. And you almost died the time you overdosed on crystal meth. But I kept you alive. And he said, if you would have died either one of those times, you would have went to hell. And you would have been separated from me and forever torment." Just Jesus talking to me. And he said, you would scream out to me, give me another chance because I hear those screams now. The Lord speaking to me. He says, I hear those screams now. Give me another chance because the Bible says they're not cast into the lake of fire yet. They're in hell. He can hear them screaming out. And he said, you would have begged me just like the rich man in the parable just for one more chance. And he told me, he said, now that I've given you those two chances, how dare you take the blessings I've given you as an excuse not to serve me. And he said, if your life was lost in Pakistan, was I not good to you? That's what the Lord told me. 
If I, if I allowed you to die for my name's sake, because Jesus died, the disciples were murdered, over 100,000 Christians die a year in martyrdom. You're seeing it right now in Syria and Egypt. It happens, friends. Would you complain? And with tears coming down my eyes, I said, no, oh, Lord. And then he told me the parable of what's called the unworthy servant or the unprofitable servant, where it says a man hired a servant. He worked in the field all day. And when the servant came in, the, 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 man, the manager said, feed me before you feed yourself. And Jesus said, that's what the kingdom of God is like. After you've done everything that you've done, if I ask you to do one more thing, you still do it because I'm worth it. And you say that to people in the world, they don't get it. Because you know what? They have so much pride about who they are. They have so much self-exalting pride. They have no idea that they were lost without Christ. Because if you knew who you were in God's eyes, in the past tense, you could serve people today. Because you would just be grateful to be alive. Just to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Just to have breath in your lungs today. You would be so thankful. And if he asked you to wash a thousand feet, you would do it. Because you know where you came from. It's those who don't have an honest understanding of where they came from that can't wash people's feet. And then lastly, Jesus knew where he was going. You see, I know where I'm going when I die. I go to heaven. So I want you to go with me. And if me washing your feet today helps give the illustration of Christ and humility to you to help knock down that pride of your life or help inspire you to serve others. If I can assist you in this journey, it's my honor because I'm going to heaven. I know where I'm going. I want you to meet me there. Now ask yourself these questions as the uh, men get ready for the foot washing. They're going to start bringing up the chairs and everything. Ask yourself this question, number one, will I allow someone to wash my feet? Will I allow someone to serve me today? That's putting yourself in the place of Peter. Will you allow yourself to be served? We're not giving because we're expecting something back. We're giving because we want you to be loved today. Jesus said at the end of this passage, do this in remembrance of me. Do this because I did it for you. The second person I want you to put yourself into the shoes of is the shoes of Jesus. Will you wash others' feet? Will you wash others' feet? Because Peter was the one at one point getting his feet washed. But then as he went throughout his life, he washed others' feet. When we talk about washing feet today, you could symbolize washing people's feet not only literally, but in all the areas of life that you're called to be a servant. Washing your wife's feet by washing the dishes, buying groceries, and helping out around the home, gentlemen. Wives, washing your husband's feet by complimenting him encouraging him, supporting him in his dreams. Young people, washing the feet of your parents by being obedient to their wishes and their desires. Does everybody get the point that washing feet translates into our everyday life? Do you get it? Don't get distracted by the chairs. Look at me, please. Washing feet translates into a life of servitude wherever we go. Have you ever gotten that kind of American self-centered attitude? I know I've dealt with it. And you're out at a restaurant, and before you know it, you don't care about the waiter's feelings anymore. You ever been there? And all of a sudden, you're like, bring me my water. This is not right. Send it back. And have you ever stopped? Has the Lord ever convicted some of you and said, stop and look at that waiter, the one you just treated like that? God's done that to me. And I've stopped and I've looked at them. And I've had to apologize and say, man, I'm so sorry I treated you like that. I've had to go back to the post office and apologize before. You know why? Because God says, I'm here to serve people, Joe. I'm here to serve people. See, we're here to serve people. Jesus was here to serve people. If we think because we're paying a waitress a certain amount of money or a tip to, to eat their food, that we don't have to be kind to them, that we don't have to be patient to them, we're people of pride. 
If we don't think we need to serve our employees, bosses, how many bosses do I have here? Managers. I'm a boss. I'm a manager. I understand. Listen, if I ever think that it's not my job to serve Adam, but it's Adam's job to serve me, take away the pulpit from me. Take away the microphone. I become a dictator, not a leader. The way we become great in this world according to Christ is not the way the world becomes great. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it like this, in the world, the greatest among you are those who are in charge, and they lord it over you. You ever been to Beverly Hills? You ever been to San Francisco? You ever been downtown Michigan Avenue, shopped in a nice store? You'll see people lord over you, their money, snobbery. He said, in this world, that's how they do it. Politicians, people with money, they lord over you. He said, but not in my kingdom. The greatest among you will be the servants of all. Is that in the Bible or did I just make that up? Jesus said, you've seen it done like this by people in the world, but that's not how it will be among you. At one point, James and John, the brothers of Jesus, they came up to him with, it, with their mom. I mean, come on, you know you want a favor if you bring your mom along. These two disciples brought their mom along and said, hey, Jesus, we got a favor to ask you. We want to ask you something. And, and Jesus goes, oh, uh, yeah, uh, what do you want? And, and they said, well, when you get to your kingdom, can we sit on the right and the left? Oh, come on, somebody. I mean, that's not pride or what, but you know you'd be thinking the same thing. You know, don't pretend you wouldn't be thinking the same thing. You're hanging out with the king of the universe. Hey, Jesus, when you get up there, can I get a nice whip? Can I get a nice ride? Jesus, can I get a match? We all think this way. What do we get out of it? You know how many people have come to these altars saying, pray for me for a new house, pray for my job. I hardly ever hear anybody come to these altars and say, pray for me to be a servant. Pray for me to serve my husband. Pray for me to serve my wife. Pray for me to be a better employee on my job. Pray for me to be a better servant in this church. Can't even count maybe on one hand the amount of times I've heard, heard that prayer request. But it's always make me great, make me this. You know what Jesus did? Jesus called over one of the little children, and he said, these are the greatest. Have faith in a heart like them. If you've raised obedient children, you know what I'm talking I have to include obedient in there. My children will be obedient even to the point where it scares me how obedient they'll be. I'll say, Bethany, don't move until I get back, and she'll literally just stay right there. These are obedient children. They're not always. And I've said to Bethany, okay, spit out your gum. Okay, Bethany, you need to eat this. She'll eat it. You know, God forbid if I was a bad parent giving her poison, right? God forbid. But look at their simple trust. Dad says eat. Okay. Dad says time to go to bed. Okay. Dad says spit that out. I'm going to choke. Hannah almost choked on Laffy Taffy yesterday. Spit it out. You're going to choke. And God is saying, do you trust me like that? Date that person. No, get away from that person. Don't watch that. Don't go there. No, spend your time here. Spend your money here. Do we want to hear that from God? Are we like his children? You see, that's what he's looking for. As we get ready to wash some feet up in here, I want you to think about those two things. Am I like Peter today who's refusing to get my feet washed because I don't understand? Well, then let's get the right understanding. Or can I be like Jesus when I leave out this place and serve people? and honor and integrity. I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 before we start to wash feet, and I'll share with you how we'll do it. Uh, Rachel, would you come, please? We're honored to serve you. Philippians chapter 2. This is going to be awesome. So excited about this. Adam, can you do me a favor? Lower down this mic stand and, and uh, help me move this up here. As you're turning there, please look up at me as we get ready to close out today. The church is here to serve people. And we're to be the first examples. Because if we're the best disciples here, we'll be the best disciples in our families and on our jobs and in our high schools. Children at their homes. Like I've said before, I've never met a boss 
that said, hey, we want to hire you, but we just want to make sure first you're going to steal from us. Are you going to steal? We're just looking for thieves. Remember, I've given you that example. I've never met a boss that said, hey, uh, before we hire you, we just want to make sure you have a really sassy temper and you're going to lose it from time to time and cuss people out because that's really what we're looking for around here. You know, I've never heard of a boss to, to say, uh, you know, hey, are you willing to, you know, leave early and clock out and do just the minimum you have to do to get by? Because we're really just looking for lazy people around here. We just can't get enough of them. No, bosses are never like that. They always say, we want the people of integrity. We want the people that are going to work the best, have the greatest heart. Well, shouldn't we learn that here? Shouldn't politicians learn to do this? What if politicians, what if Mayor Rahm Emanuel brought together his staff and televised him washing their feet, saying, I'm just a servant, elected official here to serve the people of this city, and I just want to help and do my part. I'm just a nobody serving a big somebody, telling everybody about him. What if government officials started acting like they trusted in a big God instead of their small plans? What if bosses came around and washed everyone man just think about this imagine if your boss tomorrow said guys before we start work just want to wash all your feet you call me boss and that's rightly so but I want to be a servant to you I want to make you great at this company and by doing that we'll have a job 10 15 20 years down the road what if husbands and wives washed each other's feet? Do you get the point? It translates into everything we do. Now look at the attitude, because you got to have the right attitude. How could Jesus know about the power, where he came from, where he was going? Somebody say he had the right attitude. Thank you. Philippians 2, 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any, anything in common and sharing the spirit, if any tenderness, compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Everybody say like-minded. Thank you, having the same love, being one in spirit, one of mine. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing. Nothing on the job. Nothing in the government. Nothing in your home. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Because that's how Enron's happen. That's how political things get corrupted. That's how families end up divorced. Do we understand we're not to be selfish? Selfishness hurts people. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interest of others. Not to your own interest, but look to the interests of others. How can I make a better product for others? How can I serve this customer? How can I serve my wife? How can I serve my family? How can I look to the interest of others? In your relationships with one another. Listen to what it says. In your relationships with one another. Everywhere you go, have the mindset of Christ Jesus. Have the attitude. That's literally what it means. Have the attitude of Jesus. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on the cross therefore God exalted him see he knew where he was going exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God